A small laboratory was tucked into the side of a grassy hill in the middle of nowhere. Only one side of the building was exposed. All painted gray with brushed aluminum and dull red accents, around some important bits like the door with no handle. A gravel lot with two cars in it, surrounded by a hilly sea of green, waving in the breeze. Winding back and gradually down into the guts of the hill, long, well-lit hallways connected lots of plain, well-lit rooms, all empty and unused. There was an air of expectancy and readiness, undertones of heartlessness, in the dim metallic aftertaste of impending doom. Despite what seemed to be almost intentional and absolute abandonment, there were, far back in a remote cluster of the complex, a few rooms being used. Heavy machines lined the floor and the counters here, machines made for only one purpose each, dizzying swirls of mechanized glassware and chrome fittings, glowing crystalline orbs spinning on long spindly arms or tucked away in tubes on stacks of racks and banks of computer monitors with wavy charts scrolling by over long strings of numbers and Grecian symbols. Silver conduits ran along the walls, Red and white and green dots of light winked in a pulsing, uneven chorus in ripples around the room, and thick insulated wires and hoses hung down from the ceiling to various important devices in their places. A man stood at a counter with a wide stance, his head bent down at the papers spread before him as he ran his finger across some of the information and relayed its significance to the man next to him, who was leaning back against the counter and cleaning his glasses on his lab coat. Uh, sample rate is up, recurrence steady, and with density and torpidity down, if we do this again with no hiccups and no butterfingers, and a larger subject, we should finally have some conclusive results. Of course, agreed Dr. Reggie Walker, putting his glasses back on and blinking at space a few times. He was tall and dark-haired and didn't have anywhere else to be that would pay him this well. You know, Jenny asked about you the other day. Couldn't help saying a few things. What? Who's Jenny? Asked the first man, looking up from the papers. You know, Dr. Randallbottom. Uh, I was in for my yearly review, and it turns out she's also the one in charge of renting out these spaces. And also the one in charge of our funding. And also the one in charge of the mayor and the county commissioner and I think even the governor, and in charge of when the red lights turn green and back to yellow and red again. I, r I really don't know why I called her Jenny. I saw it on one of the, the degrees on her wall. The first man, Dr. Sam Shelfton, was shorter but smarter and probably did have better places to be. He formulated and released a pronounced, um, and was about to go on before Dr. Walker continued, which wasn't a surprise. The problem is, he mused, she's got a truth augment. I could see where they'd put it in behind her ear, so when she asked about you, or I thought she was about to, I had to tell her, but don't worry, I didn't say anything. Uh, a truth augment? Yeah, one of those, um, didn't you watch that YouTube video I sent you? You can get a chip installed. Uh, that makes it so you can tell when people are telling the truth or not. But I watched this other video, and how it works is you can only tell if there is truth in what they're saying, not how much truth, like like if it is a partial lie or a half-truth or something. So I mean, there are ways out of it. Man, what are you talking about? Did you tell Dr. Randallbottom stuff about me? No, come on, dude. What did I just say? There's ways out of it. You gotta salt the truth, you know, like a little pepper in the pudding, a booger in the sugar. So you did tell her stuff. Sam Shelfton had an unpleasant look on his face. She, she had me up against the wall with the og, dude. I, I went on and on about all these weird parties you go to, especially the ones where you watch silent films on a bed sheet and everyone wears the linked up headsets to hum along with each other what they think the soundtrack should be. And also that for the past 10 years you've been trying to invent fingernail clippers and that sometimes you come back home and 
Um, I told her you live with me and 20 or 30 other industry professionals in a warehouse. I told her you come back home smelling like grease and fish and helium balloons and pizza pockets and whatever the opposite of fresh dirt and grass after a thunderstorm is. Yeah, I, I, I told her what you keep in your attic, even in those back boxes. I told her about your idea of a healthy diet with all those hydrocarbons and aerated metafats, and she was just staring at me, and I think she had me in some sort of weird trance, so I just kept telling her and telling her about all those sweatshops in Taiwan you have, and how even with the nice art on the walls, the people working there don't seem that happy, and, and how you trophy hunt ladybugs and have scale male pajamas uh, made out of ladybug shells you sleep in every night, and every night... You sleepwalk and pee in the sink because it's an easier target. And I told her you pull strands of stranger's hair on the subway and make friendship bracelets. And you have only seven teeth and four fingers and twelve toes and eighteen legs. And one day you'll be born. And if we're lucky, we will see your true value to us as a perfectly formed and well-proportioned man straight from the root of the earth where all things are purified and pent up until they are released in great magmatic and fiery spasms through whatever volcanic womb happens to be nearby on that fortunate day when to us will be presented once and never more a chance to grasp at sweet, sweet eternity and all the bittersweet effluvia that comes with it. Dr. Walker was slumping to the floor and Dr. Shelfton was disposing of a syringe with a long needle he had just stuck in Dr. Walker's neck. I don't even like ladybugs, Dr. Shelfton stated, almost questioned as he walked back to the man on the floor who was gurgling a little and grasping at Shelfton's legs. Dr. Walker coughed and spat a little and managed to choke out a few more words. That, that's the whole point. None of that was true, but she thought it was because there were elements of truth to to all of it. With his fingers, he tried to crawl his hand up Shelfton's leg like a spider with a whole human body attached to its butt. You do wear pajamas, and you do support sweatshops, and you like movies, and I saw you wearing a fr friendship bracelet once. His hand fell to the floor, and he, he writhed a little bit. She'll gamble everything on her truth, Og, and you can prove her wrong on all accounts. Eh? Why? Why? What did you... What did you get me with? I'm, I'm, tr I'm helping you. And he trailed off as his face went a little numb, and he couldn't see anything anymore. It's okay, buddy, Dr. Shelton grunted as he dragged the limp body across the room. If you'd read any of the notes sent down by Dr. Randallbottom's office, you'd have seen that the next step here requires a roughly human-sized subject. And what's more roughly human-sized than you? You may or may not have been explicitly named. Dr. Shelfton managed to get the larger man up onto an open area on a central counter with the help of a pneumatic arm hanging from the ceiling and started attaching some straps and diodes to him. Did you think it was weird that your yearly review was only four months after your last yearly review? All right. Remember how our last subject couldn't sit still and that messed everything up? Let's not go through that again. We don't have any treats left over. Dr. Shelfton walked away and flipped some switches at a computer terminal.